We're coming from uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. Didn't feel that creative this week, so the title is simply uh, Put Off, Be Renewed, and Put On. Sometimes, you know, just the, the titles just come to you, and this one, it just, it just didn't. So this is, those are pretty central words. I think we're going to roll with that. You know, we live, we live in a world where, I almost sound like I'm, like I'm one of that, I'm that movie trailer guy, in a world, you know. Uh, we live in a world where image is everything, right? We live in a world where, where clothes make the man or make the woman. Clothing brands promise to make you a new person, that you'll be more attractive, that you'll be smarter, that you'll be picked first for the kickball team, whatever the, the case may be. And you see that, you see that in, in, the, in their products, in the way that they, they market everything on, in advertisements, on TV, internet, on magazine covers and things like that. And we see it clearly. The sad reality is, though, as helpful as a new set of clothes can be, new clothes don't really make us a new person. They just cover up the same old us in a new way. They really just cover up who we really are. But we see here in the Bible that God is telling us to put on something new, not to make us new, but because God himself has made us new. In, a, in essence, God is telling us to become who we are in him. And so here's my main idea for today. Main idea, of kind of our roadmap for the day is this. Put off the old self. Be renewed in your mind and put on your new self. Put off, be renewed, and put on. Pretty simple, right? Let's roll through this together. Before we really get into the meat of the text, I want, to re I want us to see this. If you look there in verse 17, uh, we can see clearly that this isn't just what Justin's saying. This isn't just something that even Paul is saying. This is something that God is telling us. Paul says, uh, now this I say and testify in the Lord. The word testify means to give testimony, to give witness, to give a representation of what someone has seen or heard. And so what Paul is saying here is, I'm testifying this in the Lord. This is not my own idea. This is something that God gave me to give to you. So, Paul is telling us what he's heard. And so now, what is Paul testifying to us? First of all, look there in verse 22. We're going to skip around in the text this morning, and I'll show you why. Uh, look, there, look first in verse 22. Paul says, put off the old self. Put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Verse 22 shows us two main things about the old self, or literally in Greek, the old man, the person you used to be. First, he shows us that it belongs to our former way of life. It belongs to our former way of life. Friends, if you're trusting in Jesus Christ, you've been called out of a former way of life into a new life. To paraphrase from Paul somewhere else where he says, the old is gone, the new has come. Paul says in verse 17, and, and, so I, and I want you to see this now, we, we see in verse 22 through 24 that phrase, put off, be renewed, put on. And then specifically here for put off, verses 17 through 19 kind of back up and give us a bigger picture. So now uh, let's look through verse 17 through 19. Paul says, verse 17, now I testify, I say this and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Who are the Gentiles? We've heard about them a lot in the book of Ephesians. Basically, there were Jews and there were not Jews. The not Jews are Gentiles. Anybody who's not essentially a part of the covenant community of God. 
And so when he says that here, you must not, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, he's implying you must not walk as people who do not know God walk. People who do not know God and therefore act like they don't know God. I think sometimes we get really concerned about how people around us that don't know Christ aren't acting in a Christian way. Duh! Of course! They don't know Jesus. Why would they act that way? I think the, the days of, of us having a, a, a shared understanding of morality are gone. That's over. If there ever really was one. Maybe we were tricking ourselves into thinking that there was one to begin with. But that's gone now. And so, again, these are people who do not know Jesus, and they act like it. And if you're trusting in Jesus, there was a time that you didn't know him. There was a time where you were numbered among these Gentiles. And you acted like it. Shocking, right? Sometimes it's, it's hard for us to think back to that day. Let me, let me just lay all your doubts to rest. There was a day where you didn't know Jesus and you acted like it. And every person is different. But in this, in this aspect, we were all the same. Before you trusted in Jesus, your life was focused around you, what made you happy, what you thought was right. To borrow from Proverbs, you leaned heavily on your own understanding. And if God hadn't intervened in that life of yours, it would have led you to destruction. Because you see, to, to live in the old self, to live that old way of life, is to reject God as king. Which means that to reject God as king, we are guilty before him and deserving of his infinite wrath against sin. The old self belongs to our former way of, former way of life, and it is corrupt through deceitful desires. It is corrupt through deceitful desires. And we see more of this in verses 17 through 19. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Futility means useless, worthless, serving no purpose. Why were our minds relegated to futility? Look at verse 18. It says, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Hardness of heart refers to an inability or an unwillingness to respond to God's truth. Literally in the Greek, uh, the, the word there in Greek, it means harder than marble. So I think this is where the phrase, a heart of stone, uh, comes from. So <coughs> uh, the phrase, again, harder, heart of stone, this is a hardened heart that leads to ignorance, as Paul says there. Ignorance, being unaware or uninformed of God's truth. That brings, and again, we, kind of, we see this kind of piling upon each other. This brings what? Alienation from God, separation from God. I'm reminded of John 1, where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 4, uh, again, the, that, the light shines in the darkness. Sorry, no. The hymn hymn was life, and that life was the light of men. God himself is our light. And in response to man's sin in the garden, God, who alone is our light, saw fit to remove his light from mankind, leaving us, like Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, if, if the light in you is darkness, Jesus said. How great then is the darkness. Friends, that's where we were. And if you're not trusting in Jesus Christ today, if you're not a Christian, this is what the Bible says about you, where you are right now. I don't say that to hold that over you. I feel like the, the most loving thing that I can do is to tell you the truth. I would rather tell you the truth and risk you being offended by me than you continuing on in a, in a lifetime of ignorance, a, a lifetime of not being aware of what God says and the penalties that will come because of this reality. And the result of that, look at verse 19. They have become callous. 
They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Calluses, that's a fun word, right? Calluses are where the skin no longer feels, that no longer is sensitive to, to pain, no longer sensitive to feeling anything. And as Matthew could probably tell you, and as, as I would gladly tell you, we're glad as guitar players that our fingertips are calloused because dragging your fingers over wound steel and copper and bronze repeatedly over and over with lots of pressure, it would really, really hurt. So sometimes calluses are a good thing, but sometimes calluses can be a dangerous thing. Having a calloused heart before God is a dangerous thing because it means that as we encounter God's word, as we encounter people who tell us about Jesus, then our hearts are completely unfeeling. They're completely dead and numbed to any kind of poking or prodding that the word of God may be doing on our hearts at that moment. It means that you're completely unresponsive and unaffected by the truth of God's word. And if by sin you've alienated yourself and calloused yourself against the only one who can fill your heart with true joy, then where do you look for joy? And the Bible tells us. Verse 19 says, they have given themselves up to sensuality. And I think we have a lot of preconceived notions about this, this word. It's actually much broader than we give it credit for. The, the word sensuality essentially means the pursuit of pleasure in all of its forms. The pursuit of pleasure. It may, be, it may be food and drinks. It may be games and sports. It may be sex. It may be TV and movies. It could be binge watching your favorite show on Netflix. It could be a number of different things. And I think sometimes we, we want to limit it to just one thing that may be either we want to hide about ourselves or limit it to one thing that we feel very far from and say, oh, look at that. That's terrible. The problem is the Bible doesn't draw that line. It's much it's much deeper and much wider than we would ever want it to be. See, that's the thing about sin. Sin will take you further than you ever dream of going, and it will leave you there much longer than you would ever want to stay. This is something for all of us to hear. Are you seeking pleasure in the created things rather than in the creator himself? And the list goes on, of course, many different things that we could talk about. But I want you to hear the desperation here. You see, because we're, we're really good at putting our best foot forward. We're the Instagram generation. We're the Facebook generation where we put forth all of our best moments for everyone to see. We're really good at making people think that we're okay. But I want you to hear this. Listen to the desperation here. It says, they have what? Given themselves up to sensuality. Greedy to practice what? Every kind of impurity. As a human race, this is us. This is where we are without Christ. And it doesn't mean that any one person is doing all these things. We're not as bad as we necessarily could be, but all of us are sinful. Every, apart from Christ, every inclination, every desire of our heart is deceitful. It lies to us and it points us away from Christ. We are sinful people apart from him. This is the plight of mankind apart from Christ, willfully, continually following the desires from our deceitful, desperately sick hearts. And that's not Justin's words. That's God's words in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can know it? And then verse 10 gives the answer. The Lord knows the heart. God sees beyond your Instagram posts. He sees beyond whatever it is that you're posting on Facebook and Twitter. Endless other lists of social media. God knows your heart. You can't hide from him. Willfully, continually following the desires of a deceitful, desperately sick heart, leading us from one temporary means of pleasure to the other. 
because none of them can satisfy. And it leads us on a road toward destruction. Apart from Christ, that's where we are. Like the song says, I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way. The sin that promised joy in life had led me where? To the grave. I had no hope that you would own a, a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. But as I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross where I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I know is grace. Hallelujah. My everything, all that I have is Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus is my life. I have nothing apart from him because if we look back as scripture tells us to, we see the desperation, the, the complete loss of hope that we were in. And yet Jesus, yet Jesus in his, in his mercy and his grace reached down to that cold heart that dead heart of stone and created life. I couldn't work my way to heaven, so heaven came down. You're not a Christian today because you changed your mind or because someone gave you a compelling argument. You're a Christian today because Jesus Christ replaced a dead heart in your chest with a heart of flesh. He changed your heart. You were dead, but now you're alive. And in response to his calling, you did what? You turned from your sin. You put off the old man. And you turned by faith to Christ. You, you were, your mind was renewed and you put on the new man, the, the man or woman that Christ made you to be in him. I feel like I'm stepping on my own toes to, before I get to the rest of this, but that's what happened. That's where we were, and that's where Jesus has brought us to, into this kingdom of light and justice and truth and goodness where we are with him. Not just forever, sometime in the future, but you're with, he's with you now. Isn't that good? That is good news. And so again, in response to his calling, again and again and again and again, we put off our old selves, we remove it. We, res we discard it. That's what it means to put off the old self, to remove, to discard, to no longer identify yourself with that. You're still in the world, of course. Otherwise, the moment that you came to know Christ, boom, heaven, gone, right? Right? But according to God's good plan, we're still here. To know him here, to, to treasure him, and to make his good news, his gospel known. Not just in this room, but in this city, because it's too good to keep to ourselves. In this city, in this country, to the ends of the earth. I have no illusions in my mind about whether or not you're all going to stay here forever. No, we're going to be moving, changing, going and the gospel goes with us because whether we are here or whether we are all over the place, we are the church. We are the church, not this building. We are the church and we carry the gospel. And we take the gospel as light in a dark and weary world that needs hope. And you might be thinking, okay, Justin, great. Great. I know, I was dead, now I'm alive. I was lost, now I'm found. I was blind, now, I'm, now I see. Any other comparison that I can think of in an old hymn somewhere, all right? And we've heard this in this series, you know, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but by grace you've been saved. We've heard it again and again. We're, I'm good, I'm trusting in Jesus, I'm saved, I'm good now. Can't we move on to something else? Can we? Can we really? Are, are we really good? I mean, show of hands, who had a perfect week this week? Who 
trusted in Christ every second of every day? Who put on the new self every second of every day? You see, if I'm honest with myself, more often than I care to admit, that old self feels so natural, so comfortable, so effortless to put back on that I find myself clothed in rags all over again. Again and again and again. And it can happen in an instant. But the effects can linger on and plague my mind for the rest of the day, for the rest of the week. You may be struggling with something that happened seven or eight days ago. That's how powerful sin is. And Satan would love nothing more for that to linger on in your mind. That feeling of powerlessness. Does it sound familiar? That's what we left behind to trust Jesus. Not because we suddenly pulled ourselves up by our own bootstraps, but because Jesus reached in and saved us. He saved you from that. Don't run back there again. Even Pastor Matthew talked about it last week, how we won't be perfect until we're with Christ in heaven. And so again, I'm so glad that God in his love doesn't just give us this one-time class that, and then says, hey, you're good. Good luck trying to obey all my commands. But instead, in his kindness, he gives us a realistic picture of that old life again and again and again. Just like a parent tells a kid that that funny face on your wall isn't a funny face, it's an electrical socket and it can hurt you. I mean, let's get real here. Anybody else think that's what that was as a kid, you know? But God in his kindness he shows us a very clear, realistic picture again and again. Why? So that he can hold us under his thumb? No, because he loves you. And he has a plan for you to make you complete in him. And guess what? When we go through difficult passages like this, where we're reminded of our sin again and again, it's his grace. Not to tear you down, but to build you up. Not to build you up and feeling good about yourself, but to build you up in your trust in him. So that you look more and more like him because you're trusting him more and more. And, John, and Paul in verse 20 says, but that is not the way you learn Christ talking about that old life, following those deceitful desires. That is not the way you learn Christ, he says. Verse 21, assuming that you have heard of him, or you've heard about him, and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self. You see, the church in Ephesus, and really we too by extension, have learned the exact opposite of the world's way. And how do we do that? When we heard of Christ, hearing the gospel, and then being trained again and again and again in the gospel, we are learning a way that is so different from the world around us. Not only that, but in Christ, we are repeatedly taught to put off our old self and, number two, to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. We can't put on the new self unless we have new minds. Notice first that this is passive. You don't renew your own mind. That's not the way that it works. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The world is on an endless quest to remake itself, and we talked about that already, right? That if you do this, you can remake yourself. But the truth, again, is only Christ can make us new. And so if you are in Christ, stop hoping, stop hoping that you'll, be re that you'll be made new. In Christ, you already have. 
it's finished in Christ the moment we trust in Christ. But yet at the same time, it's ongoing. It's that already, but not yet. And Christ has promised that as we read his word, that he will renew our minds. Be, be not conformed to the ways of this world, Paul says in Romans 12. But be renewed in the renewing, be transformed in the renewing of your mind. So yes, we work, of course. Of course we work. We work by studying the Bible. We read his words, not as this mundane, repetitive burden that we have to carry, but because it's the words of the king, the one who saved us, the one who loves us and the wants, to, wants us to be with him, to transform us. The, we should treasure these words. We should be like the psalmist and say, how sweet are your words to my taste? That the word of the Lord is pure, pure like gold, fine gold and silver. So we, yes, we work we treasure God's word. We read his word regularly. We prayerfully, we, f we do it fully, prayerfully, regularly, and expectantly. And we'll talk more about that later. The spirit of God. And as, as we do this, as we read the word, God's own thoughts put, into, put on pages for our good. God through his Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God takes the, the thoughts of God and the word of God and infuses it, infuses the mind of God into the people of God for the glory of God. Isn't that good? That's why we must read the Bible regularly, fully, prayerfully, and expectantly. But it doesn't stop there. We're to put off our old self to seek for God to renew our minds, but we do something more. We don't stop there. If we stop there, we've still missed it. We put on, number three, we put on the new self. You see that there? He says, put on the new self, verse 24, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. What does that mean? What does it mean to put on the new self? Let's look at verse 24. First, the new self is created after the likeness of God. We're created in the image of God. That's what we see in Genesis chapter, chapter one, chapter two. Let us make man in our image. And it says, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The world is trying to convince us. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. Um, in Christ, God is restoring us because we were twisted and marred by sin. That image of God was twisted and marred in sin. And in Christ, we are being remade. We're being remade into what he created us to be, to reflect him to all creation. So in essence, again, God is telling us, become who you are. Become who I created you to be. And what does that look like? And it's gonna, it's gonna take us weeks to, to unpack that. It's, it's basically the rest of the, of the book of Ephesians. Uh, Zach, Zach Henning's gonna be back up here next week. He'll be, he'll be uh, walking through part of that passage and then we'll, we'll keep on walking through it together. Um, I mean, it, it's about to get super practical up in here. It's gonna be good. I'm excited. Um, so uh, it's gonna take us a couple of weeks to get through that. But look how Paul describes it here in verse 24. Two, two key things here. First, in righteousness. Oh, sorry, uh, a couple of key things here. Verse 24, in righteousness, created after the image of God, in righteousness, doing what's right, and holiness, being completely separate from sin. And what adjective does he use to describe all that? In true righteousness and holiness. True righteousness and holiness. True, meaning that it, it corresponds with what actually happened. You know, truth is becoming a very unpopular word in our world. The world's trying to convince itself that everyone's worldview is equally valid. This is not a new thing. This has been happening for quite a while. And to challenge that by making what we've now heard referred to as an absolute truth claim, to do that is, is, is labeled offensive. In keep, out of keeping with uh, the rules of society. 
even might be considered foolish, closed-minded, bigoted. Needless to say, the world's, the world's view that all worldviews are equal and that there really is no absolute truth, if we think about it, it actually, that in itself is an absolute truth claim. Let you think about that later on today, right? When you say there's no absolute truth, you're saying that your own statement is true. Yeah. But with that, the truth is exactly what John said, or what Jesus said in John chapter 3. And this is the judgment, Jesus said. The light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whatever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Friends, the Bible is clear. You cannot have true holiness and true righteousness, no matter what this world says. You can't have true holiness and righteousness apart from knowing God through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the way to God. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no, no one comes to the Father except by him. So if you're not a Christian today, I'm not here telling you just to simply give up bad things bad actions. I'm not just telling you to, to, to lay down bad things and to pick up good things. But instead, I'm telling you, I'm begging you to lay them all down for the best thing, knowing God through Jesus Christ. Find pleasure forever in him and watch as he transforms your mind and your life. If you're a Christian, you came to Christ by turning from your sin and turning to Jesus Christ by faith. This starts a pattern, again, of the already but the not yet. That continual walk as a Christian of turning from sin, turning to Christ, putting off the old self, putting on the new self in Christ. And it's all done by Christ in you through your work. And I want you to hear that. We could, come, we could come out of this with two very, da very dangerous uh, ends of the spectrum. One, it's all on Jesus. I don't have to do anything. That's wrong. We're commanded to work. Or we could come out thinking, I have to work, 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 and I can't ask Jesus to help me. I have to do that to get his approval, and that's not right either. Instead, look at what, look at what Ephesians chapter 2 says. Or sorry, not Ephesians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2. I don't think I have a slide for this, so I just, you'll have to listen. Philippians uh, chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. You might hear me say that a lot. Just as we pray, as we talk about things, praying that God will give us the power and the desire to do what pleases him. And that's where this comes from. It's not about your ability to work to receive God's favor. If you're in Christ, then you've already received his favor. He gave it to you as a gift. And so therefore, work, trusting that Jesus will give you the power and the desire to do it. So applications. First, are you regularly putting off the old self? Is there some sort of sin, some kind of rag that you're, from that old self that you're clinging to right now? Is there some way in which you're intentionally hardening your heart toward God's word, bitterness towards someone, greed, gossip, selfishness, pride, seeking phys physical ple pleasure in one of a, a number of ways instead of seeking eternal satisfaction in Christ? I'm reminded of Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, where it says, where God says here, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed out cisterns, jars, water jars for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Essentially, we're taking the fountain that's never ending and it will supply all of our need and we're saying, ah, forget that. And I wanna, I wanna bend down and try to suck water out of the dirt. There's nothing else that's meant to hold our hope the way that Jesus can. Jesus made it that way. Not so that he could keep us under his thumb, but so that we could have what is best. And what's best is him. In 
And friends, if that's you, don't shrink back from God in shame. The last thing I want you to walk away from here today is feeling shamed, feeling guilty. Instead, run to God. Come to the fountain and find fulfillment, find satisfaction forever in him. If you're trusting in Christ, it's already yours. He belongs to you and you belong to him. Turn to him. and experience the joy that passes all understanding. So are you regularly putting off the old self? Are you regularly being renewed in the spirit of your mind? Are you, be, are you reading the Bible regularly? Are you reading the Bible regularly? We'll, we'll hear in a couple of weeks in Ephesians chapter five that Jesus washes us with the water of the word. How often are you washing? Are you like the guy that said, you know, I wash once a month whether I need it or not? Are you comfortable? Would you be comfortable physically washing as often as you spiritually wash? Maybe you're not a very disciplined person. I completely get that. So instead of feeling guilty about how you can't get into a a habit of reading God's word, what are things you have to do all the time anyway that you can attach Bible reading and and, and prayer to? Just piggyback them on something you're already doing. It helps. It really does. Are you reading it fully? Not just are you reading it regularly, are you reading it fully? Are you reading the entire counsel of God's word? Or are you just reading a little bit here or a little bit there, things that you're comfortable with, think, things that you know? I know. Deuteronomy and, and Leviticus, they're tough. The minor prophets, they're tough. But it's a part of God's word. And all of scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for us so that we may be equipped for every good work. <laughs> like the... The theologian Lecrae said, take responsibility inside the whole council, not just an area where you you might have a mouthful, okay? We want to have a regularly, a regular and balanced diet of the word. How do we know that we're walking in line with, with what God says if we're not willing to read all of what he said? So do you have a plan do you have a plan to read through the, through the entire Bible in the next year, the next two years? Maybe with your life group, maybe with a friend. Find accountability. Find someone that's gonna hold you accountable and that you're gonna work together on this and help each other. Because Not because it's something good to tack on our chore chart at the end of the week, but because God is worth it. To know him better is worth it. Are you reading it regularly? Are you reading it fully? Are you reading it prayerfully? When you read, are you asking God to teach you, to reprove you, to correct you, and to train you in righteousness so that you can be equipped for every good work? And then lastly, are you reading expectantly? I think we missed this one. We might, we might do it regularly. We might even do it fully. We might even do it prayerfully. But sometimes we'll do that, and then when we get to reading the word, we completely forget that we've asked God to do these things. Are you reading it expectantly, expecting him to answer as you read? If not, the Bible says in James, preview, we're going to James next, stoked about that. Um, But the Bible says in James that if you you pray and ask God for things, but don't expect him to answer, you're setting yourself up to be a double-minded person, unstable in all your ways, and that you shouldn't suppose that you'll hear anything from the Lord. What a terrible way to live. And yet I fear that more Christians than not live in that cycle. We pray, but we don't pray specifically. And when we, even if we pray specifically, sometimes we don't expect him to answer. What a horrible way to live with no assurance and no hope, even though we're in Christ. 
You've asked him for it. Trust that he'll answer. And that whatever he answers, that it's for your good. Because remember, just as Paul said in, in 2 Corinthians, all of God's answers to you are yes and amen in Christ. It just might be yes to something else than what you're asking. And so his yes to something else might sound more like a no to you now. But it's for your good. And then thirdly, are you putting off the old self? Are you being renewed in your mind? And are you regularly putting on the new self? Avoiding what God says to avoid is good. Reading his word and praying for him to renew your mind is good. But are you pursuing holiness and righteousness in the truth of God's word? If we could look up here on the screen and see uh, a playback, uh, a time lapse of your life over this last year, could we see a growing pattern of pursuing Christ? And I want you to see that that word pattern is the key here pattern. We're not looking for holy perfection. I'm not expecting you or myself. I know better than that. I, I, we're not expecting holy perfection, but, it, but in Christ, are you moving in a holy direction? Let's say that again. We're not expecting, God does not expect holy perfection from you. He's working in you. He knows that we're dust. Amen? But his plan is to move you in a holy direction. So, slowly yet surely, is your life looking more and more and more like him? Because you're putting off the old self. You're seeking to be renewed, to be renewed passively by Christ through his word. And you're pursuing with everything that you have the new man. You're putting on again and again and again the new man to be made more and more like Christ for his glory, and for our good. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for how you encourage us, how you build us up in you. Lord, we love you. And Lord, we confess that more often than we care to admit, we are putting on the old self. Lord, we want to confess that to you today. We, want to, we don't want to keep that from you. Lord, help us not to run in, in fear Help us not to run in shame or in guilt, but Father, for, may we turn. May we put off the old self. May we come to you seeking to be renewed, to be made new in our minds by, cry, by you, God, through your word. And Lord, give us the power and the desire to put on the new self again and again and again so that our life looks more and more and more like Jesus and less and less and less of that raggedy, old, tired, sinful man that we were before. Lord, we love you. We want to be more like you. We want to trust you. We want to follow you wherever it is that you would have us to go. And Father, if there are things that we're holding on to today, would you convict us of them? And would you give us faith to trust you and to let them go? If there are grudges in here, if, there are, uh, if there's strife, if there's bitterness, if there's sin that's lurking in the midst of these pews today, Father, I pray that you would give us the power and the desire to confess it to you and to leave it there and to pursue you with arms wide open, loving you, seeking to make your, your great name known here in this city and to the ends of the earth. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.